Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We're glad that you could join us again this week as we take a look at lesson number 11, Longing for God in Zion. An exciting study as we're getting close to the end of our 13 weeks together. But as we begin, let's start with prayer. Father, thank you for being with us through this journey. And as we look at how we can long for you in Zion and understand more about what Zion is and what it means to truly long for you there, we ask that you'll guide our time together. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So our guest this week, as each week this quarter, is Dr. Dragoslava Santrak. She has a PhD in Old Testament and a deep love for the book of Psalms. Slava, thanks for joining us again today. Thank you for having me. So this week, we're looking at longing for God in Zion. Let's start with this question. What exactly does Zion represent in the Psalms, and what's the significance of this week's study? Yes. Well, let's start with uh, the question what Zion actually is. Mount Zion, and people can see it and visit it today, is a broad, low hill uh, adjacent directly to the south side of the old city of Jerusalem. And in the Bible, Zion is often used uh, as a synonym for the city of Jerusalem and uh, also for the entire land of Israel. So Zion is very significant in, in the Psalms because it represents God's holy mountain. And many Psalms uh, say that the foundation of the temple, the foundation of the Lord's sanctuary is the Mount Zion. Now the mention of the mount is very significant because it conveys this important message that the God's temple is more than just a building. It's even more than just a city, it's a mountain. Therefore, it's something that's much bigger and greater than people can build and make uh, to honor God. And as Solomon in his dedication prayer for the temple said, God cannot be contained in a building. He's greater, greater than the temple. Also, the mention of the mountain has its significance in its ancient Near Eastern background. Because in that culture, in that world, the mountains, and especially the mountain peak, represented the contact point between the celestial and terrestrial fields. It was a channel of communication between the divine and the human worlds. And now the, the bigger and more impressive and higher the mountain, the more exalted is the God that the mountain represents. So it's a, it's a little odd or strange perhaps then if Z Mount Zion is kind of a, a somewhat insignificant mountain, it's not a it's not a Mount Everest, we'll put it that way. Why would God choose this somewhat low mountain then to draw the attention to? Yes, well, that's a very interesting question because truly there were and there are many uh, larger mountains in that area. For example, Mount Hermon on the north, that were higher and more impressive. And interestingly, indeed, God chose this quite unimpressive hill as his holy mountain. But there is a very significant message here. Unlike the pagan idols who needed some grand, impressive things to represent them in order to inspire worship in people, the Lord has this grandeur and majesty in himself. He is the one in his person, in his being, in his actions that inspires love and worship and his people. And what's so interesting is that it's that unlike the cultural understanding when, where the mountain uh, kind of gives this majesty to the God it represents, in the Psalms, in the Bible, it is the Lord who grants majesty and honor to this humble hill of Mount Zion. As much so that we read, for example, in Psalm 68 verse 16, that other mountains who are bigger and higher are now jealous of Mount Zion because it represents the Lord, the one who is the only living and awesome sovereign God. 
Let's read Psalm 68, verse 16. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which the Lord God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. So seeing that the Lord chose Mount Zion and the Lord is that high and lifted up God, all these large mountains are fuming with envy. So it's a very interesting picture of this, this lowly hill that God exalts, uh, very different than the other way around for others. Why, why, are, why are the Psalms dedicated to uplifting this hill? What's, again, it's not the hill that's important, yes. but it's, it's God exactly. that's exalting that. Exactly. So all these songs that express love for Zion, that lift up Zion on high and praise Zion, they actually praise the one who, to whom this hill belongs, and, and this is the Lord himself. So that helps us understand Zion in the context of the, of the book of Psalms. There are different types of Psalms that we come across in here. Some of the Psalms are called Psalms of Ascents. Um, any connection there with, with the mountain? Mm, yeah, yes, absolutely. The Psalms or the Songs of Ascents, uh, Psalms 120 to 134, uh, form a distinct collection or distinct hymn book within the book of Psalms. Now, the, the Hebrew title uh, is a bit unclear, but it's taken by most interpreters and scholars and in tradition to mean the songs of ascent, of going up, going up where? Up the Mount Zion, up to Jerusalem and the Lord's Temple. And most likely these songs were sung by the pilgrims on their way to the city of Jerusalem during the three annual uh, festivals, uh, the festival of Passover and uh, uh, Pentecost in the spring and the Feast of Tabernacle in the fall. And uh, these songs are quite short and easy to memorize and they celebrate God's goodness and His love and protection. So it was something to, that lifted up the spirit of the pilgrims on their long journey. And as they were coming closer to Jerusalem, the song became more fervent and more excited because they are coming to, to bow down before God in His temple. So these shorter songs of ascent, songs of encouragement and, and uh and moving forward, are there any of them that kind of stick out in your mind as ones that are just particularly, uh, that you appreciate or that mean something significant to you? Yes, yes. I mean, all of them have, have such a wonderful, wonderful message, but I especially like for some reason, Psalm 123, which says, unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens, behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until He has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord. And I love this picture. It's very, very tangible and it's very intimate. We can imagine a servant who depends for his living on his master, who depends on, on his master for his protection, for housing, and, and uh, he looks at, at his master's hand. And that's what we do. We look up to the Lord at his merciful and loving hand until he shows mercy on us. So this is one of several songs of a sense that yes. we could kind of grab a hold of. As we're, when might these songs be an encouragement to us? When would be a time that we might say, you know, maybe I need to go back and look at one of those songs of a sense. Yes. What, what might that look like in a person's life? Yes, we, we should note here that uh, uh, many pilgrims came uh, from situations of hardships 
and faced many challenges from within and without. So verses like, for example, Psalm 126, verse 5, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. And we have many verses like this that, that uh, um, speak of the psalmist's distress, like Psalm 120, in my distress I cried to the Lord and he heard me, deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. So the pilgrims experience all kinds of hardships like we do today. And uh, as they were going to Jerusalem, they were b bringing their burdens with them to bring them to the Lord's feet and leave them there and find rest and blessing and reassurance. So each of these Psalms, you will find the treasure of reassurement or, or encouragement for, for your current situation. So yes. that should be an encouragement. I mean, we take a look at the challenges that we face in life today, and there are no small challenges. Uh, whether people are facing health challenges or spiritual challenges or relationship challenges, financial challenges, there's a, a long list of challenges that we face today. And you may be facing something like that. If you are, then these Songs of Ascents were written for you to give you some encouragement, to give you some hope, to give you some help. And maybe your life is going just fine, but you know somebody who's going through some challenges. Share with them one of these Songs of Ascents and give them a little bit of hope, a little bit of encouragement as they're going through some difficult and challenging times. Because even though you may be just fine, somebody else may be having some difficulty and God may be giving this to you so that you can then share it with them. Songs of Ascents, talking about ascending Mount Zion. We're going to be coming back in just a moment or two, but before we do, I want to remind you, don't miss this opportunity to pick up the companion book to this quarter's Sabbath School lesson, of course, on the book of Psalms. Dr. Martin Klingbeil has authored this book. You can find it at itiswritten.shop. That's itiswritten.shop. And it will be an incredible blessing to you. We'll go into greater detail on the things that we are looking at day by day and week by week as we go through this quarter's lesson, giving you some more encouragement, helping you to dig more deeply and learn more about the Psalms than unfortunately we were able to, uh, to put in the study guide itself, the quarterly study guide itself. Only so much information could fit in there, but that, uh, that companion book will be an incredible blessing to you. Couple that with these, uh, these talks that we're having each week with the author, and you're going to have a wonderful, wonderful study indeed. Well, we'll be back in just a moment as we continue looking at week 11 as we study the book of Psalms. We'll be right back. It's one of the most challenging books in the Bible. Why do hard challenges come? Why does God allow difficulty and distress? And what's going on behind the scenes in a world filled with suffering and sorrow? Our ongoing series, Great Characters of the Bible, continues with a look at the life of Job, a man described by God as perfect and upright, yet afflicted by a devastating illness. Some of the most difficult questions people have deal with the God who permits suffering. Yet the Bible presents logical, accessible answers that make sense and grow your faith in the God of heaven. Struggling to find answers, his integrity attacked by his friends and questioned by his wife, Job's journey into the depths of anguish provides answers for everyone and presents a clear picture of the character of God. Don't miss Great Characters of the Bible, Job. Brought to you by It Is Written TV. If you enjoy coloring, then you are going to love the Buried Treasure Coloring Book from My Place with Jesus. The Buried Treasure Coloring Book has more than just pictures to color. You'll also enjoy activity pages, each accompanied by their very own audio story. Mr. Dixon came across a small, well-weeded rice patch out in the middle of a field. Get ahead of a rainy day or a relaxing evening as a family and order the Buried Treasure Coloring Book from It Is Written. Welcome back to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. We're looking at lesson number 11 about Zion. 
Slava, let me ask you a question. What makes Zion the source of hope, the source of joy for, for the psalmist? And, and why is the sanctuary such a special place that a day there brings more happiness and joy than a thousand days elsewhere? Yes. Well, we a bit started this, this topic uh, in the previous segment when we mentioned that the sanctuary was a safe haven, a, a place of refuge for the pilgrims who came from various uh, difficulties and situations of hardships. So being in the sanctuary represented a place of peace for them. But other than that, of course, worshiping the Lord in His sanctuary was a very special experience. And experiencing the fellowship of the believers, that was a special treat for, for, for the people. So much so that, for example, in, in Psalm 133, verse 1, there is this beautiful metaphor uh, describing the fellowship of the believers in the temple. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, uh, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of the Mount Hermon. It was a special event, a special occasion to experience this fellowship of believers and to receive that support from your community of faith in a very special way. And also, that was a time when people renewed their commitment to the Lord's covenant. And we read in the Songs of Ascent about the Lord's covenant and this renewed commitment and devotion to the Lord, when people receive the forgiveness of sins and, and assurance of salvation. And perhaps I should also mention one social element which should not be uh, um, neglected, uh, and that's that the thrones of judgment were placed in Jerusalem. And we read in Psalm 122, which is also a song of ascent, for the thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Now the thrones of judgment points to these judgment seats where people could bring their various inquiries or, or, or queries that they had, disputes even, and receive justice for themselves. So going up to Jerusalem had this religious, spiritual experience, but you see how wonderfully in, in, in God's kingdom that's tied to the social element of having justice and the due uh, righteousness and the due right things uh, for, the, for the people in the realm of social life. So this well. was a very positive experience yes, for people, something yes. to look forward exactly. to, to anticipate and yes. to enjoy. Now, this of course all happened thousands of years ago. That We don't have the sanctuary per se, to go to today. Um, Mount Zion is, is far away from us. We don't go there with any regularity, if ever. How does this kind of apply to us living today in, in our world? How can we enjoy some of the same blessings that the psalmists talk about here? Well, we can draw some valuable practical lessons from the experience of the ancient Israelites and the songs of ascents. Um, last week we spoke about remembering history, and I, I believe we, we, we all remember and enjoy those psalms of remembering history. Now one significant uh, aspect of remembering history is remembering by participating. So therefore, taking time to go up to Jerusalem, and some people lived quite far away, and many pilgrims traveled on foot, so it would take days. But taking time to travel, taking time to sing these songs of ascent, um, taking time to make booths during the Feast of the Tabernacle and live in the booths uh, for seven days, 
um, taking time to prepare this special food for Passover and eating this uh, a bread without yeast and, and uh, uh, bitter herbs and recount this past historical acts of God where God delivered his people and participating uh, not just mentally and spiritually, but physically as well was a way of remembering history. And it's a great lesson for us today to have our worship services interactive and helping us to participate in the history. And the Lord in the New Testament established the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion, where we take uh, uh, the symbols of Christ's body and, and blood and we participate in the foot washing. All these things are very important. They help us participate holistically. And of course, today, as you mentioned, Eric, we don't go to Mount Zion, the physical mount, and we don't need to because that mount represents a much larger and glorious mount, and that's the holy temple in heaven, where our high priest, Lord Jesus, serves on our behalf. And we are invited to freely approach Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary and receive his blessings. Yeah, and I think you mentioned also the judgment seats in the old yes. sanctuary. We, we can recognize that, of course, we get justice and judgment, yes. justice in judgment uh, when we come to the, to the heavenly sanctuary as well. Very encouraging. The book of Psalms talks about praying for the peace of Jerusalem. What is, what is that? You ask different Christians, you're going to get different answers as yes. to what that represents. Yes. What do you think the psalmist meant and, and how does that apply to us today when it talks about praying for the peace of Jerusalem? Yes, well, this uh, uh, request comes from uh, Psalm 122 and it is verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem May they prosper who love you. Verse 7 goes on saying, Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Unfortunately, this is such a relevant, relevant uh, a request, such a relevant prayer for, unlike its name, Jerusalem, the city of Salem, of Shalem, of, of peace, Jerusalem, unfortunately, historically, had very little peace, been engaged in so many wars. And in these unfortunate recent re events, we are again reminded that we need, that we are called to pray for literal peace of Jerusalem, for all the people, for all its inhabitants, for all the suffering and innocent people there. But this prayer transcends the physical peace of Jerusalem and points to the eschatological kingdom of God, to this eschatological Jerusalem, the city of peace, which God will establish on this earth at Jesus' second coming. The glorious things that are said of Zion in the Psalms and the rest of the Bible are actually never seen in history. So they are prophetic expectations, prophetic predictions of the coming kingdom of God, the coming kingdom of peace. And when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we pray for the coming of the Lord's kingdom on yeah. this earth. There are some things that we're not seeing right now. We wish we saw right now, but unfortunately we don't. But one day we will see. Uh, the fulfillment of those things. As far as Zion goes, what is the significance of Zion for the rest of the world? Yes. We, we have an understanding of what about the rest of the world? How does that fit in? Yeah, I love the Psalms, how they place a huge emphasis on this universal aspect of God's work, on this universal aspect of God's plan of salvation. It is not just for one particular people, one particular nation, but it is for all the peoples of the world. And in this context, Psalm 87 is such a wonderful, wonderful psalm. In it we read that the Lord will make the inhabitants of 
all the earth, the citizens of Zion. For example, we can read uh, verse 4. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, or Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. So these are all nations that obviously were not uh, a part of the ancient Israel. And so they were not part of God's covenantal people. But this, in this Psalm, the Lord says, I will make all these nations, symbolically representing the entire world, I will make them to say this one was born there. Where there? Well, in, in, in Jerusalem. And of Zion, it will be said, this one and that one were born in her. And then verse 6, the Lord will record when he registers the peoples, meaning the nations, this one was born there. So we see here that the Lord wishes all the peoples of the world to become the citizens of his holy mountain Zion, of his city of Jerusalem, of his kingdom. When did that happen in history? It happened in our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the promised seed of Abraham, all the peoples will be called blessed and will be made the sons and daughters of, of, of the Lord, of our God. And we can read about that in Romans chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, how in Jesus we have been adopted into the family of God and become citizens of Zion. Isn't that wonderful? So that's, that's an incredible truth of, of New Testament times, that fulfillment from something in the book of Psalms and something that gives us indeed a great deal of hope. Yes. And we hope that this is giving you some hope as you're studying uh, with us through the book of Psalms, looking at the significance of Zion, looking at how this applies not just to ancient Israel and the people of, of David's day, but really it applies to us, it applies to you, it applies to me, and it applies to the many strangers who are out there as well, who maybe don't yet know Jesus. This is an opportunity for us to give them some hope, to give them some help. As we study through the book of Psalms, we're gaining a greater picture, a clearer picture of the plan of salvation and Jesus' desire for each and every person to be saved. Well, we have yet two weeks left in our study through the book of Psalms, and we're going to be covering some incredible ground. You don't want to miss either of those studies. But until then, we wish you God's richest blessings, and we look forward to seeing you again next week here on Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. <laughs>